Israeli strike kills at least 40 in Al Mawasi humanitarian zone. United Nations warns of dystopian future with treacherous new normal. Good afternoon and Salam Malaysia Madani. This is World Today and my name is Daryl Baptist. Today's broadcast begins with some sad news. A strike on the Al Mawasi humanitarian zone in Gaza's main southern city of Khan Yunus killed at least 40 people and wounded 60 others. Gaza's civil defense agency said its crews were still working to recover 15 missing people as a result of the Israeli attack on the tents of the displaced in the area. The strike hit at Al Mawasi, which was designated a safe zone by the Israeli military earlier in the war, with tens of thousands of displaced Palestinians seeking refuge there. However, Israel's military has occasionally carried out operations in and around the area. Civil defense sources said that the strike had left behind large craters. According to civil defense spokesman Mahmoud Basil, many families disappeared under the sand and in deep holes in the Al Mawasi massacre. The Israeli military said in a statement that its aircraft struck significant Hamas fighters who were operating within a command and control center embedded inside the humanitarian area in Khan Yunis. However, Hamas said that claims that its fighters were present at the scene of the strike were a blatant lie. On another note, UAE authorities have announced the completion of polio vaccination of 460,000 children in the Gaza Strip in the first eight days since the start of the vaccination campaign. In total, 640,000 children in the Gaza Strip are planned to be vaccinated against the virus. Vaccination is being carried out in 150 centres by more than 2,000 medical workers. The campaign to vaccinate children against polio in the Gaza Strip started on 1st September and is being carried out jointly with humanitarian organisations from the UAE, the World Health Organisation, UNICEF and the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine refugees in the Near East. The UAE previously allocated $5 million for the vaccination. In July, the Gaza Health Ministry declared the enclave a polio epidemic area, citing the months-long fighting as the main factor for the spread of the disease. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un said the country is now implementing a nuclear force construction policy to increase the number of nuclear weapons exponentially. He said this in a speech marking the 76th founding anniversary of North Korea yesterday. According to the North's state-run television, KRT, the leader mentioned that he will get his nuclear force fully ready for combat and there is no limit to how much he will expand his military muscle. Kim commented that a strong military presence is needed to face the various threats posed by the United States and its allies of expanding a nuclear-based military bloc in the region. The pledge comes as Pyongyang seeks to counter South Korea's moves to strengthen its defense partnership with the US and Japan after the three nations signed a pact on military training in July. With everything that's going on in the world today, it comes as no surprise that the United Nations rights chief Volker Turk has warned that the world needed to change paths to avoid a future filled with military escalation, repression, disinformation, deepening inequality and rampant climate change. Opening a session of the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva, Volker Turk stressed that the world is now at a fork in the road. We can either continue on our current path, a treacherous new normal, and sleepwalk into a dystopian future, or we can wake up and turn things around for the better, for humanity and the planet. In a world wrecked by conflicts, including Israel's war against Hamas in Gaza, Russia's war in Ukraine and the civil war raging in Sudan, Turk insisted that states must not accept blatant disregard for international law. 
Currently, he warned that the world appears comfortable with the crossing of innumerable red lines. He stressed that the world's new normal cannot be endless. Vicious military escalation and increasingly horrifying, technologically advanced methods of warfare, control and repression. He also warned against a free-for-all spread of disinformation, smothering facts and the ability to make free and informed choices. The World Trade Organization, also known as WTO, said open trade alone was not enough to reduce inequalities between wealthy and developing nations, and more was needed to be done to help poorer countries. The WTO's 2024 report on global trade looked at the role that commerce has played to narrow the gap between economies since its creation in 1995. WTO Director General Ngozi Okonjo Iwiala said the biggest takeaway from the report is its reaffirmation of trade's transformative role in reducing poverty and creating shared prosperity. She noted that there are more efforts that can be done to make trade and the WTO work better for economies and people left behind during the past 30 years of globalization. The report found that low- and middle-income economies tend to engage less in international trade, receive less foreign direct investment and depend more on commodities. They also export fewer complex products and trade with fewer partners. Less trade will not promote inclusiveness, nor will trade alone. True inclusiveness demands a comprehensive strategy, one that integrates open trade with complementary domestic policies and effective international cooperation. And that's the third main conclusion of the report. For the WTO, the immediate priority is to uphold an open, predictable, and non-discriminatory multilateral trading system, a task that is becoming increasingly challenging in today's complex environment. Chinese President Xi Jinping has urged visiting Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez to play a constructive role in improving strained ties between Beijing and the European Union. Sanchez, for his part, said he hoped the EU could avoid a trade war with China and both nations must work together to resolve differences through negotiation. In their meeting, Xi also talked up deepening commercial ties between China and Spain in sectors such as artificial intelligence, digital economy, new energy and other high-tech fields. The Chinese leader said Beijing wanted to work with Brussels to further develop a China-EU relationship where the two maintain their independence and autonomy but also succeed together to bring benefit to the world. Sanchez, meanwhile, said Spain wants to work constructively so that relations between the two are closer, richer and more balanced. In the ámbito of the relations between the Union Europe and China, España, primer ministro, tiene la firme voluntad de favorecer y de impulsar el diálogo, la negociación y los acuerdos equilibrados que beneficien tanto a la Unión Europea como China. Queremos tender puentes para defender justo, juntos un orden comercial justo en el más escrupuloso respeto del marco multilateral y manteniendo nuestros mercados abiertos que permita crecer a nuestras economías y beneficiar a nuestras industrias y a nuestras sociedades. Y final For the first time ever, Samarkand, a city in Uzbekistan, has been chosen to organize two international textile conferences, namely International Textile Manufacturers Federation Annual Conference and International Apparel Federation's World Fashion Convention. With the theme of innovation, cooperation and regulation, drivers of the textile and apparel industry, the focus of the joint conference is to spur and broaden the potential of the textile industry. Over 1,000 renowned industry players and more than 500 international organizations participated in the conferences. The event brings together the entire supply chain in the textile industry to engage with industry experts and leaders on matters such as relevance of innovation, cooperation and regulation. Numerous pressing issues were discussed towards developing a sustainable global textile and apparel industry.
Uh, the objective of ITMF is to bring together members from different countries to exchange ideas, to understand each other, and also to promote cooperation between textile producing countries. This is the main objective of ITMF. And uh, today we are in Uzbekistan, and Uzbekistan is a country which has been growing in textiles, and uh, it gives an opportunity for the rest of the world to see what is happening in Uzbekistan and for the Uzbekistan industry to promote its products uh, the and its infrastructure. The textile industry is experiencing a big leap in productivity driven by active investments and utilization of new technology. Just last year, the global production of textile and apparel reached 8.2 billion in volume, almost 4.2 times bigger compared to seven years ago with market size of over 1 trillion US dollars. Tragedy struck when the, he when the head of El Salvador's police forces and a man arrested on charges of a multi-million dollar embezzlement were killed when the military helicopter in which they were travelling in crashed on Sunday night. Seven other people also died in the crash in the Pasaquina district in the southeast of El Salvador near the border with Honduras. Police director Mauricio Ariaza was escorting the former head of a credit union, Manuel Cotto, back to El Salvador in the helicopter. Cotto, who was accused of embezzling 35 million US dollars, had been arrested earlier on Sunday in Honduras after attempting to flee the United States. He was subsequently handed over to Salvadoran police. The seven other people who died in the crash included three police officers, three servicemen and a Justice Ministry employee. President Nayib Bukele demanded further investigation into Ariaza's death and praised him for his contribution to national security and his roles in various police operations. Bukele declared three days of national mourning in honor of Ariaza, who was appointed by him in 2019. Ariaza has helped lead a nationwide crackdown on gangs that has driven down the country's homicide rate, but has also drawn criticism from human rights groups for the campaign's arbitrary arrests. Still ahead, Germany extends border controls to curb irregular migrations. But before that, Singapore has proposed a law to ban deepfakes and other digitally manipulated content of candidates during elections. Introduced by the Ministry of Digital Development and Information, the Elections Integrity of Online Advertising Amendment Bill would introduce safeguards against digitally generated or manipulated content during elections that includes artificial intelligence generated misinformation, commonly known as Deep fakes. If passed, the bill would prohibit the publication of digitally generated or manipulated content during elections that realistically depicts a candidate saying or doing something they did not say or do. This prohibition will only apply to online election advertising that depicts people who are running as candidates. A spokesperson for the ministry said it would take effect once the writ of election is issued and until the close of polling, as the content published during this period can have a material impact and influence on voters' behaviour. Over in India, the Supreme Court has ordered all doctors protesting over the rape and murder of a female medic last month to resume work by today, warning they may face adverse action if they fail to adhere to the deadline. Hundreds of doctors nationwide have stayed off work as they demand justice for the woman whose body was found on 9th August in a classroom at RG Carr Medical College and Hospital in Kolkata in the eastern state of West Bengal, where she was a trainee. Doctors have also demanded better amenities in government-run hospitals, which they say lack security and basic infrastructure, such as resting spaces for staff. The Supreme Court said that no adverse action 
action would be taken against doctors who returned to work by Tuesday evening. The court also directed the West Bengal government to take steps to assure doctors that their concerns are being addressed, including by providing separate duty rooms and toilets for male and female personnel. The court, which took up the matter of its own accord following outrage over the incident, had earlier formed a hospital safety task force to recommend steps to ensure the safety of medical workers. Bangladesh's War Crimes Tribunal is seeking the extradition of the oust leader Sheikh Hasina from neighbouring India, as she is accused of carrying out massacres in the country. Weeks of student-led demonstrations in Bangladesh escalated into mass protests last month, with Hasina quitting as Prime Minister and fleeing by helicopter to old ally India on 5th August, ending her iron-fisted 15-year rule. More than 600 people were killed in the weeks leading up to Hasina's ouster. Bangladesh last month opened an investigation led by a retired High Court judge into hundreds of enforced disappearances by security forces during Hasina's rule. Chief Prosecutor of Bangladesh's International Crimes Tribunal, Mohammad Tajul Islam, said Bangladesh has a criminal extradition treaty with India, which was signed in 2013 while Sheikh Hasina's government was in power. He added, as she has been made the main accused of the massacres in Bangladesh, the tribunal will try to legally bring her back to the country to face trial. Hasina has not been seen in public since fleeing Bangladesh, and her last official whereabouts is a military base near India's capital, New Delhi. A judge has ordered Lebanon's former central bank chief, Riyad Salame, to remain in detention amid a probe into alleged financial crimes committed during his tenure, including embezzlement of public funds. Investigative judge Bilal Halawi took the decision after questioning Salame for the first time since he was taken into custody last week on charges that the state media said included embezzlement, forgery and illicit enrichment. Halawi set another hearing this Thursday. According to judicial sources, Salame was suspected of accruing more than $110 million via financial crimes involving Optimum Invest, a Lebanese firm that offers income brokerage services. If the prosecution continues, it would mark a rare case of a serving or retired senior Lebanese official facing accountability in a system which critics say has long shielded the elite. Salame was long fettered as a financial wizard in Lebanon, but left office with his reputation shredded by corruption charges at home and abroad and the catastrophic collapse of Lebanon's financial system in 2019. In light of mass migration happening in the EU, Germany has decided to tighten border controls and curb irregular migrant inflows. Temporary controls would be extended to Germany's land borders with all nine of its EU neighbours. Interior Minister Nancy Faeser said the measure would limit migrations and protect the citizens against acute dangers posed by serious crimes. Ausgehen. Bis wir mit dem neuen gemeinsamen europäischen Asylsystem zu einem starken Schutz der EU-Außengrenzen kommen, müssen wir an unseren nationalen Grenzen noch stärker kontrollieren. Diese Kontrollen ermöglichen auch effektive Zurückweisungen. Wir haben ja bereits mehr als 30.000 Zurückweisungen seit dem letzten Oktober an den deutschen Außengrenzen. Wir werden daher unsere temporären Binnengrenzkontrollen auf alle deutschen Landgrenzen ausweiten. Dies habe ich heute the extended border controls, which will come into force on 16th September for an initial six months, were notified to the European Commission yesterday. Germany already has temporary controls along its border with Austria, which were implemented in 2015 to counter a large influx of migrants and have since stayed in place. Temporary controls along the borders with Poland, the Czech Republic and Switzerland were also introduced last year as concerns over migration grew again. 
We now move on to our updates from the Americas. More than a month after Venezuela's disputed election, with hopes for a peaceful transfer of power fading, a Brazilian border town is receiving a growing influx of Venezuelans fleeing their country. Migrants from Venezuela waiting to enter Brazil said the election results of the 28th July elections boosted their decision to leave the country. The Venezuelans arrived in the border town and formed long lines to get their papers to enter Brazil. Families slept the nights on cardboard on the ground to keep their place in line until Brazilian border officials processed their documents. Brazilian authorities said an average of 500 Venezuelans walk across the border every day and line up to get into Brazil and the numbers are rising steadily. According to federal police who handle immigration, in August, 12,325 Venezuelans arrived in Pacaraima, up from 8,050 in June before Venezuela's contested election in July, which the opposition says they won, as does Venezuela's president, Nicolas Maduro, setting off a political and diplomatic crisis. Wildfires fueled by soaring temperatures in the western United States have scorched thousands of acres, forcing hundreds of families to flee. A blaze burning out of control near Los Angeles sparked mandatory evacuations as it tore through swathes of tinder dry California countryside around popular tourist spots. The so-called line fire erupted on Thursday to the east of the city and exploded over the weekend, consuming more than 20,000 acres and threatening tens of thousands of homes and other buildings. Mandatory evacuation orders had been imposed and major roads shuttered as more than 1,700 firefighters battled to contain the fast-moving flames. Another blaze north of Los Angeles broke out on Sunday afternoon and had consumed 1,200 acres by yesterday morning. Firefighters ordered evacuations from the bridge fire as crews tackled it from the ground and from the air. A punishing heat wave that has gripped the region since the middle of last week was exacerbating the problem, with high heat and gusty conditions making the spread of flames less predictable. Smoke from intense wildfires in the Amazon rainforest and other parts of Brazil was choking major cities such as Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro and wafting into neighboring countries. Researcher at the National Institute for Space Research, Carla Longo, said that satellite images showed that 60% of Latin America's largest country had been affected by smoke. Authorities in Argentina and Uruguay also reported smoke from Brazil's fires impacting parts of their countries. According to the air quality monitoring company IQ Air, Sao Paulo, the biggest city in Latin America, topped the ranking of the world's most polluted major cities. The rate of fine particles in the air, a measure of air quality, reached 69 micrograms per cubic meter, almost 14 times higher than the limit recommended by the World Health Organization. Residents of seaside city Rio de Janeiro were also grappling with fine particle rates at five times the recommended limit. Authorities blame human action for most of the recent fires in the country, which are often linked to agricultural activity. The situation has been aggravated by the country's worst drought in seven decades, which experts attribute to climate change. And now on to some tech news. Apple has unveiled new iPhones built for generative artificial intelligence as it seeks to boost sales and show it is keeping up in the technology race. The tech giant has a lot riding on the new iPhone 16 and hopes that customers are enticed to buy the latest models attracted by new AI powers. Apple Intelligence is a new suite of software features for all devices that was announced in June at the company's annual developers conference, where it also announced a partnership with ChatGPT maker OpenAI. The features will be available as a software download on the iPhone 16 and other premium models next month, but only as a test and in English with other languages following down the road. 
In the short term, the new powers would include AI-infused image editing, translation and small creative touches in messaging, but not more ambitious breakthroughs promised by other AI players, such as OpenAI or Google. The new iPhones will also feature a new camera control button that can automatically search for things taken by photo or adding a calendar item based on the photo of a concert poster. The new iPhone 16 models start at $799 US dollars in the United States and will be available starting 20th September. Next up in sports, Speedy Tigers stumble in Asian Champions Trophy match against China. Stay with us. The national men's hockey squad lost 2-4 to lower-ranked China in their second match of the 2024 Asian Champions Trophy yesterday. Ranked 10 places higher at number 13, Malaysia were expected to cruise past their opponents after holding former champions Pakistan to a one-all draw on Sunday. In the match played in Moki, Malaysia's goal mouth was breached as early as the ninth minute when China's Gao Ji Shen scored from a penalty corner before Mohammad Azrai Aizad Abu Kamal equalized five minutes later. China ranked 23rd in the world compared to Malaysia's 13th, continued to dominate with Ji Sheng doubling the score in the third quarter of the match and Lin Chang Liang putting China further ahead eight minutes later with a field goal. Stunned by the consecutive goals, Sajid Singh's men fought back with sensational striker Faisal Sari scoring from a penalty corner in the 50th minute to reduce the deficit. However, Malaysia's comeback hope was dashed when Chao Ji Ming scored in the 56th minute to seal the match for China. Unlucky boys, but I'm sure you'll bounce back stronger. Now we move on to football. England captain Harry Kane will earn his 100th cap for his country when they host Finland in the Nations League at Wembley tomorrow morning, becoming the 10th player to reach the mark. The 31-year-old Bayern Munich striker who has scored 66 goals in 99 appearances for England since his debut in 2015 is the first player to become an England men's centurion since striker Wayne Rooney in November 2014. Uh, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited for the game. I'm excited to be back at Wembley. And um, yeah, I think you know I feel in really good shape. I, I feel both physically and mentally, you know, at, at a peak in, in my career. And I think you know, just watching other players, you know, like watching Ronaldo score his 901st goal yesterday, and seeing him compete at I think 38 or 39 years old. You know, it just inspires me to play for as long as possible. You know, I love this game. I love representing England uh, more than anything. The Football Association, in a statement, said they will pay tribute before the UEFA Nations League fixture with a special pre-match ceremony that will include the presentation of a gold cap. Before kickoff, the FA said they will also pay tribute to former England manager Sven Goran Eriksson, who died at the age of 76 last month. And that wraps up World Today. In our top story, Israeli strikes kills at least 40 in Al Mawasi humanitarian zone. Tune in to Malaysia Tonight coming up at 8.30 p.m. on TV1 and Salaran Barita RTM. Till then, I'm Daryl Baptist, Malaysia Madani, Jiwa Madeka. Thank you for watching.